Hello and welcome to another Stetson Spotlight. Today we will be having Dr. Dai presenting from Health Sciences and Biology Departments. Again, thank you, Dr. Dai, and take it away. Oh. Hello, everyone, and thank you all for taking time out of your busy of classes and we're getting down to the wire, so I really appreciate you coming to support me. And I'm really excited to share with you the research that I've been working on over the past couple of semesters here at Stetson. Before we get started, if I look at the people here today, I can see that we have a really diverse group. So please, if you have any questions, do not feel like you have to wait to the end to ask it. The last thing I want is someone holding on to a question and then just getting more confused along the way. So please um, feel free to interrupt me. I actually prefer discussion over lecture. So feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions and I'll be happy to answer them as we go on. So like I said, I have been doing research here at Stetson since the fall of 2020, and I've worked on several projects, but I'm gonna be sharing two projects with you today. And so that first project is what most people know me for studying. So I study viruses that cause cancer. So, um, we like to call those oncogenic viruses. And more specifically, I study Merkel cell polyomavirus and how it causes Merkel cell carcinoma. The other project that I began more recently is a project that where we are quantifying and performing whole genome sequencing of SARS-CoV-2 viruses that we isolate from wastewater here in Volusia County. And so today I'm going to be talking about both of these projects, but I'm first going to start with my Merkel cell polyomavirus and Merkel cell carcinoma project. And before I actually get to the background or the data of this project, I want to acknowledge the student that I have been working with for a long time on this project. So Kyra Tevenin is my research assistant. Kyra and I actually met when she was a first semester freshman in my intro bio course, and it was actually my first semester teaching here at Stetson. And she was interested in research, and we've been working together ever since. Um, the really significant thing about Kyra is that everything I'm about to show you was done by her, and so I'm really fortunate to have her. So Merkel cell carcinoma, maybe you've heard of it, maybe you haven't. It's a really rare but aggressive skin cancer. Unfortunately, the prognosis for Merkel cell carcinoma is pretty grim. If you're diagnosed with Merkel cell carcinoma, you have less than a 45% chance of surviving five years. It's also almost three times as lethal as melanoma. So for a long time, we thought melanoma was the most deadly cancer, and you can see that it is well surpassed by Merkel cell carcinoma. If there is a silver lining to Merkel cell carcinoma is that it's really rare, but unfortunately this is changing as well. So you can see that the incidence of Merkel cell carcinoma is increasing. So it's actually up 95% since the year 2000. And so there are currently 2,500 new diagnoses a year in the United States. And so you can see that it's increased much more than other cancers such as melanoma or other solid tumors. So Merkel cell carcinoma was first discovered and characterized in the early 1970s. But around 2008, physicians that were caring for Merkel cell carcinoma patients started to see a trend. So a lot of the people that were being diagnosed with Merkel cell carcinoma were immunosuppressed in some way. So either they had HIV or they were on immunosuppressive medications um, due to having other cancers or um, having organ transplants, lots of different things that could lead to immunosuppression. And so in the oncology field, when you usually see a cancer that is highly associated with individuals that are immunosuppressed, that can sometimes point to a pathogenic origin. And so what these physicians and researchers decided to do is they actually took Merkel cell carcinoma tumors and they sequenced the entire genome. And most of the genome was what you would expect being human, but they found that in a lot of these individuals, 80% of individuals with Merkel cell carcinoma, there was a section of the genome that wasn't human. And so when they actually sequenced and compared that sequence to other known sequences, they found that it was very similar to polyomavirus sequence. So polyomaviruses are viruses that are found to infect many species, including humans, and they're not supposed to be integrated into the genome. So that was the first strange part of this discovery. But even stranger is that although it looked like a polyomavirus, it didn't look like any polyomavirus that we currently knew of. And so because they found this new polyomavirus that was integrated into the genome of these individuals with Merkel cell carcinoma, but not in the surrounding tissue, they named this polyomavirus Merkel cell polyomavirus. And since then, they have found that 80% of all Merkel cell carcinomas are caused by the integration of this novel Merkel cell polyomavirus into the genome. And the remaining 20% of Merkel cell carcinomas are not caused by viral integration, rather extensive uh, mutational damage um, due to UV radiation. 
So usually when I get to this point of discussing my research, people get a little confused. They didn't know that viruses could, ca could cause cancer. And so this leads to a lot of questions of how the virus causes cancer, um, not even knowing that that could happen. And so before moving on to my actual research project of how Merkel cell polyomavirus causes Merkel cell carcinoma, I want to give a little crash course on viral oncology, so how viruses cause cancer. So because I really love virology, usually in my classes, I do um, teach a little bit of virology to my students. And so first thing I start with is asking students, um, you know, who of you would actually consider yourself to be a virologist? And none of them dare raise their hand for fear of being called on or put on the spot. But I say, okay, none of you consider yourselves to be virologists, but I'm sure that all of you could answer a simple question of what is a virus's main goal? And almost all of them get that viruses want to replicate. The main goal of a virus is to make more copies of itself. But viruses have a really big hindrance in doing this. Viruses themselves are not alive. They're not capable of replicating on their own. An example of something that is capable of replicating on its own is a cell. So you are made out of 40 trillion cells in your body and all of these cells are alive because they're capable of replicating themselves. And so viruses have a problem that they wanna replicate but they're not alive. And so what we consider viruses to be are obligate intracellular parasites, which is a really nasty way of basically saying that a virus in order to replicate, it will actually hijack this cell. And this cell has all the machinery to make more copies of itself. And so when the virus enters this cell, it hijacks all that cell replica replication machinery. And instead of that machinery making more copies of the cell, it makes more copies of the virus. And so first I'm gonna show a little bit of what a normal virus does. So normally a virus infects a cell, it enters the cell and it lets out its genome. That genome is basically the recipe to make more viruses. But then the, the virus gets into another hindrance of making more copies of itself. And got into a cell, that cell normally has all the machinery to replicate itself and therefore replicate the virus, but most cells in your body are actually not actively replicating. Most of them are in G0. And so this virus, remember it's an obligate intracellular parasite, it needs the cell to divide, it got into the cell, it's ready to hijack that machinery, but that machinery just isn't there because the cell isn't actively replicating on its own. And so viruses have evolved ways to, after they infect a cell, actively push that cell into the cell cycle. So the virus encodes proteins that it starts making immediately after infection. Those proteins perturb cellular pathways that tell the cell to re-enter the cell cycle. Because the cell now has re-entered the cell cycle, it's making all the machinery to make more of itself, which the virus then hijacks to make more of itself in return. Now, the key of this process is that it's a transient process. So afterwards, um, once these viruses are made, either the cell will just go back into G0 or the cell will die through immune system recognition or um, cell suicide through apoptosis. But the key here is that most of the infections that you've had, viral infections over your life, it's a transient process. They get in, they turn the cell on, they hijack the cellular machinery to make more of itself, and then it's transient. They leave and the cell goes back to G0. Now, in some instances, it goes wrong. And so these are viruses that cause cancer. So in this case, you can see again that the virus enters a cell, it lets out its genome, it makes these proteins that tell the cell to enter the cell cycle. That's normal. That's what we saw for the other viruses as well. But then something very abnormal happens. This genome that encodes for how to make the virus and it encodes for those proteins, those viral proteins that tell the cell to divide, it gets integrated into the host genome. So now that viral genome is literally part of you, it's part of your host DNA. And the problem with this is that leads to constitutive expression of these viral oncoproteins. So these proteins that tell the cell to divide are not transiently being expressed, rather they're always being expressed. And so this leads to cellular transformation. The cell has uncontrolled cell growth, which is literally the definition of cancer because those proteins that tell the cell to divide are never leaving. They're part of the genome. They'll always be expressed and they'll be turned on. And this is how viruses cause cancer. So in knowing that, something that may make you a little bit concerned in knowing is this virus, Merkel cell polyomavirus, that I just told you is integrated. It just does that process that I just described. It's integrated into the host DNA and causes Merkel cell carcinoma. That virus, Merkel cell polyomavirus, infects 80% of individuals. So 80% of the people that are watching this right now, you have Merkel cell polyomavirus actively replicating in the skin all over your body. 
But I want to reassure you that this is a rare occurrence that Merkel cell polyomavirus causes Merkel cell carcinoma. And that is because Merkel cell polyomavirus is usually a transient infection. Usually it gets in, it hijacks the cell, turns the cell on transiently, makes more copies of itself and leaves. But very rarely, it will integrate into the genome. It will have constitutive expression of those viral oncoproteins, and that leads to cancer. But it's a rare accidental event. There are some viruses that do that on purpose, like HIV purposefully integrates itself into the genome, but that is rare for Merkel cell polyomavirus, which may speak to the rarity of this cancer. So before its discovery, there were six known human oncogenic viruses. Some of these may be familiar to you, like HPV, which causes many cancers such as cervical cancers. But upon the discovery of Merkel cell polyomavirus in 2008, it is now the seventh and most recent known human oncogenic virus. And again, there are, we think that 20% of all cancers are caused by viruses. And I think it might actually be higher because obviously we're still discovering viruses that cause cancer. So as I mentioned before, we have known about polyomaviruses for a long time. So Merkel cell polyomavirus is not the only polyomavirus that we know of. It actually belongs to a family of 14 polyomaviruses that infect humans. However, Merkel cell polyomavirus is the only polyomavirus in humans that's known to be associated with cancer. And so this makes my project really interesting. You know, we're discovering something new. There's no other, it's unique. There's no other polyomavirus that's known to do this, but it also makes the project more daunting. Um, usually it's a lot easier to study something when you have another thing to compare it to and kind of direct your research. However, I mentioned earlier that polyomaviruses do not just infect humans. They also infect other species such as monkeys. So SV40 is a polyomavirus. It's a simian polyomavirus. So it infects primates and it actually has tumorigenic activity in rodents. And so SV40 being the simian polyomavirus, it was actually one of the first oncogenic viruses to be discovered. And so it's really, really extensively studied of how it causes cancer. And so myself and others, um, when we're trying to figure out how Merkel cell polyomavirus leads to the development of cancer, there have been a lot of comparative studies with SV40, even though it's in a different species, because there's nothing else in humans to compare it to. Since its discovery, Merkel cell polyomavirus has been found to be a small circular double-stranded DNA virus, has about 5.3 kilobases, so that may not mean much to most of you, but that's a really small virus. It has both a late region and an early region. So these late region proteins, there's what make the shell or the capsid of the virus. And these early region proteins are the proteins that are expressed right when the virus enters the cell. So these are the ones that push the cell into the cell cycle. Remember MCPYV, Merkel cell polyomavirus, it usually is a transient infection. So these four proteins here are expressed, they push the cell into the cell cycle and divide so that the virus can replicate. So since I am investigating how Merkel cell polyomavirus leads to the development of cancer, I'm focused on these early region proteins because these are the cell cycle modulating proteins. So here I'm showing basically another view of that. And the point of this slide is to show you something that's gonna become really important later. So I told you that this virus is a really small virus. And so it doesn't have room to encode the sequence to make small t and then encode the sequence to make large t, 57 kt and alto. So instead, it uses a mechanism called alternative splicing, where basically it has the same sequence of DNA. And based on how you splice that, you can see large T, it cuts out this region and pastes it to a region downstream, whereas small T reads through that large T splice site and encodes its own unique region. It's basically using the same DNA sequence to make four different proteins. And in Merkel cell carcinoma tumors, it's only the large and small T antigens that are expressed. In normal viral infection, all four of them are expressed, but in Merkel cell carcinoma, it's only large T and small T that are expressed. So in regards to my research project, I'm focusing on these two proteins because it's one of these two proteins or both of them combined that's leading to MCPYV um, in the development of Merkel cell carcinoma upon integration. And so this led to the first research question that we have. The question being, which of these ER proteins, large T, small T, or both, is responsible for cancer development? And our hypothesis was that the large T antigen would be responsible for the development of MCC. And this hypothesis really came from the fact that in SV40, the simian polyomavirus that causes cancer that we're comparing to, it's the large T antigen that's the dominant transforming protein with small T playing an accessory role. So in order to test this, I know that most of you are probably not interested um, a lot in the 
mechanism or the experimental method that we tested. So I'll go over it briefly. And anyone that has questions is free to ask me. But we take a fibroblast cell line, so a primary fibroblast cell line, and we transduce these with lentiviruses pseudotyped to have the plasmid of large T, small T, or a negative controlled GFP. In plain words, basically what this means is we're taking fibroblasts and we're giving them the sequence to just make large T or just make small T or just make green fluorescent protein, which is GFP. And GFP is just our negative control. It doesn't do anything to the cell. It's really important that we're approaching this question this way because just giving the cells large T or just small T means that we can study the effect of these proteins independently and not together. So that's an advantage of not just infecting these cells with the entire virus. We then select for cells that express the large T, small T, or GFP, and then we can assess these cells in transformation assays. So again, we wanna see if these cells are um, exhibiting oncogenic or tumorigenic behaviors. And so a way of assessing that in a dish is basically through transformation assays. So there are lots of different transformation assays I'm showing here, soft agar assay, proliferation rate, focus formation, doubling time, other ones that we have done with Dr. Lynch and are continuing to do um, with Dr. Lynch in the physics department are cell migration assays. And so we are working on all these. I am not gonna show the data for all of them. I'm gonna show specifically the soft agar assay. All of these transformation assays assess whether or not a cell is transformed, which is predictive of whether or not it's oncogenic. But the soft agar assay is the strongest of all these assays as it has the highest correlation with predicting whether or not a cell would be tumorigenic in vivo. So the way that a soft agar assay works is fibroblasts, by the way, are a skin cell. So we're studying skin cancer. So it's really important that we're studying the effect of these viral proteins in skin cells. Fibroblasts are usually anchorage dependent, meaning that in order to proliferate, they need to anchor themselves to a solid surface, like the bottom of a dish or a plate. So what a soft agar assay assesses is whether or not a cell is transformed by looking at anchorage independent growth. So if a cell is not transformed, you suspend it in 0.3% agarose, which is basically like a jello substance. And if a cell is not transformed, it's, it has to divide in an anchorage dependent manner. And so they will just say, stay suspended as single cells within this agarose if they're not transformed. However, if they are transformed, they don't care that they're not anchored to a solid surface. And so they will be able to proliferate in suspension and form these big colonies that essentially look like tumors within the agarose. And so when we plated these fibroblasts that either have GFP, large T, or small T in this soft agar assay, you can see that the GFP cells remained as single cells. So this is a view of the entire six well plate. Um, this is a multi-plane soft agar assay. So we actually take images of, um, I think these are 10X images of cross the plate. And then we take many Z stack images and then compress them and stitch them into a, a complete image. Here I'm showing one of those images, but you can see that our negative control, so just normal fibroblasts with GFP, remained as single cells. When we then expressed the large T antigen fibroblasts, we were surprised to see that this did not lead to cellular transformation. So you can see that there are some instances in which the cells became enlarged as if they were preparing to divide, but they never actually were capable of cellular division. And this was surprising because this was our hypothesis that the large T antigen would lead to transformation. But even more surprisingly, when we express the small T antigen in these fibroblasts, you can see that this led to really large, fast, robust colony formation. And so what this tells us is really two things. In the case of Merkel cell polyomavirus, it's a small T antigen that is the dominant transforming protein, and that's independently transforming. Usually for cancer, you need a there's a multi-hit hypothesis, so you have to have mutations in lots of different things. But this shows that just adding small t to primary cells leads to transformation. So this is a very strong oncoprotein. And remember, this is surprising because in SV40, it was the large T antigen that was the dominant transforming protein. In the case of Merkel cell polyomavirus, it's actually the opposite. It's a small t antigen that is the dominant transforming protein. Now, remember earlier when I mentioned that both small t and large t are alternatively spliced forms of the same mRNA. So large t shares a region with small t, and then small t reads through that spliced donor site for large t and has its own small t unique region. So this right here is a structure of small, the small t protein. Sorry, I clicked ahead. The small t protein area in red is the region that is shared with the large t antigen. And the region in blue is specific or unique to the small t antigen. And so because 
small t was capable of transformation, but not large t. This led us to hypothesize that the domain or the region of the protein that is leading to cellular transformation is found within this small t unique region. Because if it was in the common t region, we would expect large t to also be transforming. And so this went against our hypothesis of large T being the dominant transforming protein, it's actually small T. But this led us to our next question of, is Merkel cell polyomavirus small T uniquely transforming among human polyomaviruses? Remember, there are lots of other human polyomaviruses. Are they transforming as well? At least they're small T proteins, or is it just Merkel cell polyomavirus that is transforming? And our hypothesis was that Merkel cell polyomavirus small T is unique in transformation. And that comes from the fact that Remember, Merkel cell polyomavirus belongs to a family of 14 known polyomaviruses, and they all have their own large and small t antigens, but Merkel cell polyomavirus is the only one found to be associated with cancer. And so in order to test if the small t of Merkel cell polyomavirus is uniquely transforming, we picked two other skin tropic human polyomaviruses, human polyomavirus 7 and TSPYV, and we picked the skin tropic ones because we're using fibroblasts and it's appropriate to use a virus that would actually infect fibroblasts. So again, we took fibroblasts, we gave them either Merkel small t, human polyomerase 7 small t, or TSPYV small t, and again, again plated them in soft agar assays. So again, Merkel cell polyomavirus small t formed many colonies, but human polyomavirus 7 and TSPYV small t expressing fibroblasts did not form any colonies similar to GFP. And so this is consistent with small t being uniquely transforming and with these viruses not being associated with cancer, which shows that Merkel cell polyomavirus is uniquely transforming among human polyomaviruses, as we kind of guessed before. For interest of time, I'm not going to go through these assays, but we have done several other transformation assays, such as saturation density, proliferation rate, doubling time, um, like I said, migratory studies, passage number and senescence experiments. Um, et cetera. And so if you're interested in these, I'm happy to share them with you later. But every single time Merkel cell polyomavirus is transforming, whereas the other human polyomaviruses um, in most cases are not. So we then decided to look at and compare the structure of the transforming Merkel cell polyomavirus small t versus the non-transforming human polyomavirus 7 and TSPYV small t. And so this is basically an alignment of the protein structure. So if you don't see any differences like in these alpha helices, that means that all the proteins have very similar structure in those area, areas. And you can see that in this bottom region of the protein, they're all very structurally similar to one another. However, if you look at the top region of the protein, there are some loops that are very structurally dissimilar between the proteins. And so we, what we hypothesize is that Merkel cell polyomavirus and is uniquely transforming due to something with these loops. So maybe it's able to bind to a protein that these other ones are not able to bind to, and that's what leads to its transformation capabilities. And this was really interesting because it's directly in line with what I showed you before, where because small t was transforming but not large t, we predicted that the transforming domain occurs within this top region of the protein, the small t unique region, and that's where the structural dissimilarities are found between the transforming and non-transforming small t proteins. Whereas the common t region that we don't hypothesize is necessary for transformation because it's found in large t as well, is structurally similar between the transforming and non-transforming proteins. And so this brings us to our next question of how is MCPYV small t transforming? We know it's uniquely transforming and we know it can do it independently, but what is it actually doing in the cell that leads to cellular transformation? And our hypothesis is that it's perturbing a cytoplasmic cellular pathway that is involved in the cell cycle. And that's how it's telling these cells to divide, whether it be a natural infection or cancer. And so I'm not going to go over the experiment specifically of how we did this, but basically we just repurposed data that I got as a grad student at the University of Washington in the Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center. So I collaborated with John Lee at UW. And through this methodology, so this is basically mass spectrometry, essentially what we're doing is we're identifying proteins that Merkel cell polyomavirus small t binds to. So we put the small t protein in cells and we basically tag and isolate proteins that small t interacted with because these are the proteins that small t may be interacting with to cause cancer. And then we identify those proteins via mass spec. So this is something that I did in grad school, but Kyra and I repurposed this data um, to try to find something that small t was doing in cells that leads to cancer. So here, all of these black dots are individual proteins that were identified through mass spec. 
And what Kyra and I found as we were going through these proteins and trying to find one that might lead to the development of cancer, we noticed that a lot of these proteins, at least half, were actually nuclear proteins. So these are cell proteins. So they're proteins within the cell that small t is a binding to. And most of them are found in the nucleus. This was surprising to us because small t is a small protein, but when you look at the amino acid sequence, there is no nuclear localization sequence. And this is important because for a protein to get into the nucleus, it has to have an NLS, also known as a nuclear localization sequence, to get through the nuclear pore. You can't just get into the nucleus. You have to be basically invited there by having the correct sequence. And so if you look at the entire amino acid sequence of small t, it doesn't have a nuclear localization sequence. We also did subcellular um, prediction programs. So we put this amino acid sequence into prediction programs. And again, most of these programs hypothesized or predicted that small t antigen is cytoplasmic. So this brought up a big question of how is small t interacting with all of these nuclear proteins that may be important for transformation if it doesn't have a way of getting to the nucleus? And so we decided to actually test this. Is it true that small t is not getting to the nucleus or does it actually have a way of getting to the nucleus? And so in order to investigate this, we did a subcellular fractionation. So usually when you look at proteins in cells, you mix all of the subcellular, um, the subcellular regions of the cell together and then look at the total proteins. But in a subcellular fractionation, you just look at the membrane fraction or just the proteins in the cytoplasmic fraction or within the nuclear fractions, whether it be nuclear soluble or the nuclear chromatin fraction. And so this is what the subcellular fractionation looks like. Again, if you're not trained in looking at these, it can look complex. So these um, last images down here are just the controls to prove that the cytoplasmic fraction is cytoplasmic and not nuclear, and then the same with all the other fractions. But what I want you to focus on is the small t stain of this Western blot here. So in these first few lanes, these are fibroblasts that are expressing the small t antigen. And you can see that small t is somewhat cytoplasmic, somewhat membrane, but you can see that it has the highest level of protein actually in the nucleus, which was again, surprising. It, it makes sense that it's binding to these nuclear proteins that we identified in mass spec. But again, we don't know how it's getting there because it doesn't have an NLS. We also tested this in MKL1 cells. So MKL1 cells are a Merkel cell carcinoma virus positive cell line. So they actually got cells from the tumor. And in this case, small t is exclusively nuclear. So again, it makes sense that we were identifying nuclear proteins as binding to small t, but we still don't know how it's getting there because it does not have that NLS. We also wanted to see whether or not the non-oncogenic human polyomavirus 7 small t and TSPYV small t proteins also localize to the nucleus, like we're seeing with Merkel small t. We're still working out um, being able to detect human polyomavirus 7 small t, but if you look at the subcellular fractionation for TSPYV small t, you can see that contrary to Merkel cell small t, where it's, it's mainly nuclear, we see that TSPYV small t is mainly cytoplasmic. So this led to the hypothesis that maybe the reason why MCPYV small t is transforming and these ones are not is because Merkel cell small t is capable of moving to the nucleus, so translocating to the nucleus and binding to nuclear proteins that leads to cellular transformation, whereas these other ones are not. And so we remade our hypothesis to say that we believe that Merkel cell polyomavirus is perturbing a nuclear pathway instead of a cytoplasmic pathway involved in the cell cycle and that these other um, viral proteins are not capable of getting to the nucleus to perturb a similar pathway. So this opens up a lot more questions, and these are the questions that we're currently working on right now. So the first question is, how is Merkel cell polyomavirus small t actually getting to the nucleus? Our hypothesis is that it's piggybacking on another cellular nucle nuclear protein. So a cellular protein that goes to the nucleus, small t is binding to it and just piggybacking on into the nucleus. And I'll explain why we think that in a minute. And then our other question that we're working on right now is asking the question of whether or not this localization to the nucleus is necessary for cellular transformation. And so we're doing a couple of experiments right now that I'll introduce. And again, we're trying to answer the question if this localization is necessary for cellular transformation. So we're taking the small t protein and we're um, mutating it to include either an NLS or an NES. So an NLS is a nuclear localization sequence, and the NES is a nuclear export sequence. 
And some of you that mutate proteins may know that anytime you mutate a protein, you could affect the stability or the structure or the folding pattern of the protein. And so we're adding this with a flexible linker to the C terminus and the N terminus. And essentially what this is doing is it's changing the localization of the protein. So anything with an NES should localize exclusively to the cytoplasm. And then any small T with an NLS should localize exclusively to the nucleus. Like I said before, anytime you mutate a protein, you need to make sure that it maintains its structure and its stability. So before we actually test whether or not these mutant localization small t proteins are still transforming or not, we need to make sure that they are stable and expressed. So we're going to do Western blots to make sure they're all expressed at similar levels. If they're not, we can't um, actually study them. We're also going to do co-amino precipitations to make sure that the small t antigen, even with an NES or NLS on it, can still interact with proteins that small t is known to interact with, which means that it has uh, maintained its structure and its stability. And then we need to make sure that these mutant localization proteins are actually localized in where we would expect. So that the NES is localizing to the cytoplasm and the NLS versions are localizing to the nucleus. So we'll do a subcellular fractionation. Assuming that they pass all of those tests, we're going to assess the transformation of these mutants compared to wild type. And again, in all the assays that I explained and described before. And so this is an example of some results. So wild type proteins should be transforming and pass all these tests. Let's say that when we fuse the NES or NLS onto the end terminus or the beginning of the protein, that it's not stable. So it doesn't pass all these tests. We couldn't assess those. But let's say that when we, when we fuse these sequences onto the C terminus, that it is stable. If the small t with the NLS is still transforming, but the small t with the NES isn't, that would prove to us that small t has to get to the nucleus to do transformation. Another way that we are assessing this is we're taking our MKL1 cells. So these are these virus positive cells. So they are expressing, or I should say that they have Merkel cell polyomavirus integrated into their genome. They're expressing the small t antigen. You may remember that they are addicted to small t expression and that small t protein, as we showed earlier, is exclusively nuclear. So what we're going to do to make sure um, to verify the results from the previous slide is we're going to knock down this wild type small t and we're going to replace it with one of those mutants, either the NLS or nuclear version or the NES cytoplasmic version. And if it's true that small t must be in the nucleus to transform cells, we would expect the cells that have the NLS version to remain alive, whereas cells that have the NES version would die because they're addicted to small t expression and that the localization in the nucleus may be important for that. So again, I also mentioned that one of our other future directions, or I should say before, that after we do these experiments, Kyra and I are hoping to publish these findings. But afterwards, uh, a project after Kyra is actually identifying how MCPYV small t is getting to the nucleus, despite not having a canonical NLS. And so our hypothesis with this is that's piggybacking on another um, cellular nuclear protein. Like I said before, it's really regulated how proteins get into the nucleus, and small t doesn't have basically the password to get into the nucleus. And so it's possible that's binding to a, a cellular protein that can get into the nucleus, and that's how it's basically piggybacking in. Another way that proteins get into the nucleus, especially small proteins, is through passive diffusion. And so small t is actually small enough to just float through the nuclear pore complex, but we don't think it's doing that basically because of the fact of Merkel cell polyomavirus small t and the non-oncogenic TSPYV small t and human polyomavirus 7 small t proteins are all the same size, but Merkel cell polyomavirus small t is um, nuclear, whereas the other ones are not. So th this shows us that it's not just simple passive diffusion, but it's regulated. And again, we think that small t must be binding to a protein and it must be piggybacking into the nucleus that way. And again, we think that it's binding to a protein, most likely within its small t unique region that is structurally dissimilar from the other non-oncogenic small t proteins. And that's why it can get into the nucleus and cause transformation, but the others cannot. So in conclusion for this project, we found that small t is the dominant transforming protein of MCPYV, and it's uniquely transforming among skintropic human polyomaviruses. It gets to the nucleus, and it binds to nuclear cellular binding partners, despite not having a known canonical NLS. We know that small t is exclusively in the nucleus in MKL1 cells, and that this localization may be necessary for transformation. That's what we're currently testing right now. And then further studies are going to try to figure out how it's regulated. We think it's not passive diffusion, and that's regulated how it gets into the nucleus and identifying the mechanisms of how it does that.
So before I switch gears to the next project, I want to pause and see if anyone has any questions about the Merkel cell polyomavirus Merkel cell carcinoma project. Yeah, Jean. Hi. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have a question. I know you're putting the NES and the NLS on to look and see where it goes, but have you thought about, uh, let me make sure I get this right, mutating residues in that small t unique region mm -hmm. or putting the small t unique into one of the other ones and then seeing if that causes yeah, I've always been tempted to do both of those things. So there's an alanine scan where basically you can mutate five amino acids at a time to alanines. That's definitely something that I was planning on doing in the question of how it's localizing to the nucleus. And then um, in terms of the chimeras, so actually taking the unique region and swapping it onto seven or TSPYV, I've actually done that and they're not transforming. And oh. so it must, <laughs> it's something complex. There are most likely multiple domains that are involved and it could affect the structure of the protein, lots of different things. Sure. Um, but definitely the alanine scan, I am interested in looking into that more. There could be an NLS. Maybe it's not piggybacking on another protein. Maybe it does have a non-canonical. So an NLS that we don't actually know of yet. We've identified the NLSs that we do know of mainly from viral proteins. And so it could be possible that's using another sequence that we just don't know of. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. I will move on to the second project now. And um, we're running a little bit low on time, so I'll go through this quickly. But the second project is the project where we are looking to quantify and perform whole genome sequencing on SARS-CoV-2 viruses from wastewater in Volusia County. And again, I'd like to acknowledge the students that are working on this project. So Trinity Sterling, Brian Sanchez, and Austin Bram have been working with me since the summer, um, really troubleshooting and getting this project off the ground. Um, they're the ones who spearheaded the project and have been working at, working with it and through it as volunteer over the summer. And then also we are going to be incorporating senior research students um, currently in the proposal section of the course, but also the project starting next semester. So SARS-CoV-2 is a virus that causes COVID-19. I don't want to belabor these points because we're all sick of hearing this, but most likely SARS-CoV-2 spilled over from bats sometime in November 2019. Uh, it's the third highly pathogenic coronavirus in 17 years with SARS in 2003 and MERS in 2011. And then it's also the seventh human coronavirus. So there are four that just cause the common cold. And the reason why SARS-CoV-2 is such a successful human pathogen is it's capable of human to human transmission and it can spread during or asymptomatically and also during the incubation period. So currently, I think I took the snapshot about a week ago. So there, the, the, these are the current numbers from the WHO. So there have been over 630 million cases worldwide and about 6.5 million deaths worldwide. And the way that we get these numbers is through clinical testing. So basically we take nasal pharyngeal or nasal swabs to look for SARS-CoV-2 uh, RNA or antigen. And so when you take a test and it's positive for SARS-CoV-2 RNA or actual proteins from the virus, that is counted as a positive case and is included in these numbers. But unfortunately, clinical testing is subject to a lot of biases. And these biases really depend on if it is in the pre-vaccine era of the pandemic or the post-vaccine era of the pandemic. So pre-vaccine, we had limited testing availability. So you remember at either having to schedule an appointment or waiting in long lines if you even got tested at all. And so that could skew the total numbers. There are a lot of asymptomatic cases. So people that don't feel sick and therefore aren't going to get tested. And those won't be included in these numbers. Across the United States and across the world, there is unequal access to test. Um, due to differences in the healthcare infrastructure of different areas. And so some people just do not have the availability to be tested. And then of course, in most areas, you're not forced to get tested. It's more of a personal choice. And so a lot of people could just choose not to get tested for whatever reason. Post-vaccine, we have a lot of the similar biases such as personal beliefs. Also because more people have been infected previously or have been vaccinated, they're more likely to have mild disease or an asymptomatic case. So even fewer people most likely gain tested because they just don't feel sick. Also, we've had the development of at-home rapid antigen tests, which is great because we have more testing availability, 
But it's also a concern because a lot of people take this test and then don't report it. So they're not being included in these um, case of numbers being reported by the WHO. And then finally, pandemic fatigue. A lot of people are just kind of tired of everything that's been going on and not looking to take tests every single time they feel a little bit sick. So ultimately what I'm showing you here is that these numbers might actually be a small fraction of the total um, number of cases and infections and community transmission that we actually have. But the reason why we're able to do these tests is because SARS-CoV-2 replicates in the respiratory tract. So because it's replicating in the respiratory tract, we can take swabs to look for it. But I remember early on in the pandemic that not only did we have respiratory symptoms like a runny nose, um, cough, throat pain, which is consistent with the virus replicating in the respiratory tract, but they also started to have, um, a, see, a lot of people have gastrointestinal distress, so vomiting, diarrhea. And we didn't know why that was happening. We thought it was mainly a respiratory virus. And so there are some hypotheses that maybe the virus is replicating in the GI tract, or maybe it's confined to the respiratory tract, but there's a systemic inflammatory response, so that's leading to GI symptoms. But regardless, this made people think, I wonder if we could see SARS-CoV-2 in wastewater. I wonder if people are shedding the virus into wastewater. And it found that it was being shed into wastewater. Again, we don't know if it's, this is because it's actively replicating in the GI tract, which is leading to gastrointestinal symptoms, or if you're simply just swallowing mucus from your respiratory tract and it's passing through the GI tract and being shed into wastewater. But regardless, there were a couple groups, specifically in New York, that were testing to see, can we see SARS-CoV-2 in wastewater? Could this be a better method of pandemic tracking? And they found that, yes, it is found in wastewater. Other countries have been doing wastewater surveillance for a long time. The United States doesn't use it as much. And so basically there was a call of, let's start doing this more in more areas of the United States as a better means of pandemic tracking. And the reason why this is such a strong method is that it overcomes all these biases. So it doesn't matter if you're symptomatic or asymptomatic, where you live, what your personal beliefs are, if you got tested or not. Um, if you're infected, you're going to be shedding virus into wastewater. And so it's a much better tool to track the amount of infection in your community. So I decided why not give this a shot in Volusia County, Florida. So I spent last spring and the summer of this past year um, working with these New York groups to create a protocol to both quantify and perform whole genome sequencing on SARS-CoV-2 virions from wastewater. And it ended up being a really complicated process. I'm more of a protein biologist, so this is a little bit out of my comfort zone. So it ended up being about a 40 page protocol um, that's very, very specific, but in troubleshooting it throughout the summer and writing it, I, by some miracle, got it to work, which was really, really exciting. And then during the summer, I started training students so we could start the study. But briefly what we do, it's a four day process and it takes about six to eight hours each day. On day one, we get the sample from the wastewater treatment plant here in DeLand. It's off of Amelia, and it actually services a lot of Volusia County. So we're not just looking at DeLand. We then have to pasteurize the sample. SARS-CoV-2 is a BSL-3 agent, and so we pasteurize it so we can work in our BSL-2 lab. We filter it. We start precipitating the virus, which also goes into day two, so bringing the virus out of solution. On day three, we isolate the virus. We extract RNA. And then we quantify and sequence the virus on day four. So there are two main arms to this study. So the protocol, the three days that I just identified is how, or described, is how we get the RNA from the wastewater treatment plant sample and we isolate that RNA. And then there are two arms. So we actually quantify different time points. So we're doing this every two weeks for about a year. And so we're quantifying and comparing the amount of virus in each time point. That's the first arm of the study. And then the second arm of the study is to perform whole genome sequencing so that we can study the evolution of the virus over that year time period as well. So I'm going to start with our quantification. So again, this is a better means of pandemic tracking, and so we're quantifying the amount of virus at different time points. This um, method, so RTQPCR is how we actually quantify the amount of SARS-CoV-2 in virus. If you're not familiar with this method or don't have a background, it can be a little complex, so I'm going to describe it really simply. But essentially, we have SARS-CoV-2 virions in our wastewater sample. Through that three-day protocol I just described, we extract RNA. We then turn that into DNA. And then we want to see how much, how many SARS-CoV-2 genomes are in that sample, because each genome basically means that it came from one virus. And so to identify how many SARS-CoV-2 genomes are in the sample, right now, when we first get it, there are way too few to be able to detect it. 
So we put it in a tube basically with primers that are complementary to SARS-CoV-2 and not any of the other viruses in the sample. We then go through several cycles. So we do about 45 cycles, and these cycles all have different temperature fluctuations. But ultimately what happens is every single cycle, it exponentially increases the number of SARS-CoV-2 genomes because that's what the primer binds to. So if we started with two viral genomes, which we start with a lot more than that, but for ease of numbers, if we start with two, after cycle one, that would go to four, after cycle two, that would go to eight, et cetera. And at the end of every cycle, there is a fluorescent signal that is emitted that equates basically to the number of genomes. And so you can see that here, this x-axis is the number of cycles. In the red line, you can see that we have exponential amplification of the SARS-CoV-2 genomes over time. It forms this nice sigmoidal curve. So you can see that the fluorescence intensity gets more and more and more as we amplify the genome more and more and more. Now, an important line here is this dotted horizontal line, which is the threshold. The threshold essentially says at this level of fluorescence or at this level, yeah, at this level of fluorescence, that is um, believable of how much SARS-CoV-2 or how many SARS-CoV-2 genomes there are. You can see that we have a negative control here that doesn't have any SARS-CoV-2 RNA genomes. And so in this case, it never passes the threshold. So the threshold is a level of fluorescence where we believe that that is a legitimate signal and that that equates to how many SARS-CoV-2 genomes they are. Here we have the CT. So the number of cycles it takes before the fluorescent signal passes the threshold, the believable level of fluorescence, is what we refer to as the CT or the cycle threshold. So that's how many cycles it took for the fluorescent signal of that sample to pass the threshold. So you could imagine that if it took a lot of CT, so it took like 40 cycles of amplifying it, amplifying it, amplifying it 40 times, that means that you started it out with a little, a very small amount of SARS-CoV-2 RNA because it took so many cycles to amplify it past the threshold. So a high CT means you started with a little virus. A low CT, so just 12 cycles or so, means you started with a lot of virus because it only had to amplify it a couple times before it passed the threshold. And so we're doing this with every sample, but I hope you realize that getting a CT for a sample doesn't really mean anything. It doesn't tell us how many viruses are there. It just took us, tells us how many cycles it took to actually um, see it. And so in order to convert that CT into an actual concentration, we're comparing it to a standard curve. So basically we bought a fake version of the SARS-CoV-2 genome and we dilute it by a factor of 10 to make a standard curve. So the first tube has about 73 million genome copies per milliliter. That equates to a CT of 12. We dilute it 1 to 10, so then we have 7.3 million um, genomes per milliliter that has a CT of 15, and so on and so forth. And this is important that you see the CT is going up, so it takes more cycles to pass the threshold when you start with fewer genomes versus when you have many genomes. So I'm showing here an example of an amplification plot. So most of these lines here are our standards. So the first standard, remember it had 73 million. We know how many it had. That's why it works as a standard curve. So it had 73 million genome copies per milliliter and it had a CT around 17. Whereas when we had 7.3 million genome copies per milliliter, it had a CT closer to 20. And so you can see that the CT increases. And this is a way of basically converting CT to the actual amount of genome copies per milliliter. This red line here is our unknown sample. So in this case, our unknown sample had a CT of 29, and using the standard curve, we can convert that to genome copies per milliliter because it's between standards four and five. So standard four had 73,000, a CT of 26, and standard five had 7,300 and a CT of 31. And so we can extrapolate our CT of our unknown from the standard curve to determine that our unknown had 25,000 genome copies of SARS-CoV-2 per milliliter. And so this is a really powerful tool to actually look at our sample and to be able to visualize how many viruses are in there, the concentration of viruses in our sample at different time points. But again, I want you to realize that this is just one time point. The whole point of this study is to compare the amount of virus for many time points. And so here I'm showing the amount of virus for these different time points. So these are just the experiment names, but you can imagine this started in June and it's been going every two weeks until present. And so you can see that it's kind of messy data. So we have a little virus, then we have a lot, then a little bit less, a lot. And it doesn't really, um, it doesn't have a correlation with the actual clinical test positivity. 
And that's because there are a couple of reasons why this might be a little bit messy. The first is that RNA is really unstable. So we have to run it immediately when we get it. And so we have to create a different standard for every time point. And so if you're using your standards to extrapolate how much virus you have, but if your standard is different for one time point than another, then the amount of virus that you extrapolate or determine is going to be different, not because there's a different amount of virus in the community, but because your standards you're comparing to are different. Also, it could be at one time point, there may be more people contributing to the sewer shed than at a different time point. And so that could also make it look like there's more or less virus spreading at that time, but it's really just a difference in the number of people that contributed between the two time points. So the way that we fix this, um, for the first one, the problem is being that we have to make a new standard every time. I won't get into this too much, but we have a lot of tests to make sure that our data is comparable between the different time points. So one example is making sure that our standard curve is roughly the same between time points. So in this example, I'm just looking at standard one, but each of these lines here is the amplification plot of standard one for each different experiment. And you can see that most of them would pass the threshold at about the same time. They all look very similar, except for this green amplification plot and this gray amplification plot. You can see that those are outliers. And so that would be a reason to scrap that data. We can't compare it between time points because the standard is really different between the time points. So this is a way of deleting outliers, and we have about 20 tests that must be passed. So it's really a lot of work to get the sample and to run this, but then to make sure that we can actually use that data, we have to do a lot of analysis after to make sure that the data is actually able to be compared um, to other time points. Another problem is that, like I said, there could be a different a number of individuals that are com um, actually contributing to the sewer shed at different time points. So for instance, if we take a, a wastewater grab at 6 p.m. versus 2 p.m., the water at 6 p.m. might be more diluted because more people are taking showers and washing dishes. So you might have less virus then than at 2 p.m. And so that's a reason um, to get a 24 hour composite sample, which takes the wastewater sample um, throughout the entire day. But even when you take a 24 hour composite sample, one day could have more people contributing to another. And so in order to normalize and find out how many people are contributing, um, we, need to, we need to basically determine how many people are contributing. So if we look at these two instances here, where we have SCV06, these two experiments, let's say that in this instance, there were 2 million people that contributed. And on this instance, there were 1 million people that contributed. It may look like there was less virus on this time point than this time point. But if there are half the number of people that contributed at this time point versus this time point, really, we have to multiply that by two. And so this is called normalizing the data. And the way that we do this is basically running the same experiment as we did before, but on another virus called PMMOV. And PMMOV is a virus that is in the food you eat, and it's consistently shed into wastewater. And it's a predictive tool of how many people contributed to it. So basically, we also measure the amount of PMMOV in the sample, and that tells us how many humans contributed. So if we go back to our graph here, um, if there were really 2 million people that contributed here and 1 million here, we would have twice as much PMMOV at this time point versus this time point, and we can use that to normalize the data. So here I'm showing the data fully normalized. The orange line is how much um, clinical test positivities there were, and the blue line is the amount of virus we, just we um, found in wastewater. And you can see that they're positively correlated, so they follow the same trend, which means that this is a good tool for pandemic tracking. Um, but it's also predictive. You could see that the wastewater levels started to increase even before the Florida test positivity rate actually increased. And this is really great. So we're able to see um, it predict a surge two weeks before the surge happens because it's overcoming all these biases. And it also is a reason if you see that the wastewater levels start to increase before clinical testing, if you don't want to get infected, this would be um, an alert to start to change your behaviors because um, the numbers of clinical test positivities would most likely start increasing um, very soon. Usually when clinical tests increase, that means we're too late. And so if we can predict that earlier with wastewater testing, we can know when to change our behaviors to avoid getting infected. Um, real briefly, I want to go over some of the whole genome sequencing data. So uh, with this RNA that we extract, we're also able to perform whole genome sequencing, not just on the spike protein, but the whole genome. So we can track variants of concern over time. We can also look at mutations and um, look at new mutations that have not been described before and potentially um, see new variants of concern that have not been found in clinical testing yet.
This graph essentially is showing that the variant of concern that we're finding in wastewater is consistent with the variant of concern that is being um, found as the most prevalent by clinical testing. But beyond just identifying the variant of concern that's circulating, we're able to look at the actual specific mutations in the virus. So this is our sample from June. And you can see, I'm just looking at the spike protein, but we can, we're doing this for all of the proteins. And you can see that we identified many different mutations within the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein at this time point. And you can see here the frequency of them. So if it has a frequency of one, that means that 100% of the genomes had this mutation. Whereas if it has a frequency of 43.43, that means that 43% of all the genomes had this mutation. Now for most of them, for instance, this first one, 100% of the genomes in our wastewater sample had this mutation. And that mutation has been seen before as shown here with the blue boxes and a lot of the variants of concern that we know about. However, there are some mutations that are shown here in the red boxes that are mutations that have not been shown in any variant of concern before. So for instance, L452M, so a mutation from L to M, it was found in 12% of all of our SARS-CoV-2 genomes, but it's not been found in any variant of concern before this. And so these are the ones that we're gonna be tracking over time. They may be um, mutations that will be found in future variants of concern, and we might start seeing them increase in prevalence as time goes on if they're advantageous mutations. One last thing that we found that was really interesting is the frequency of non-synonymous versus synonymous mutations. So some of you may know that synonymous mutations are when you change the nucleic acid, but it doesn't change the way the protein looks. It doesn't change the amino acid. And then non-synonymous mutations are when you're changing the nucleic acid, but it does change the way the protein looks. It does change the amino acid. And so because viruses are not alive, they don't have a conscience, they don't know which mutations to make and they can't direct that, it's just completely random, you would expect that the synonymous and non-synonymous mutations should be about 50-50. And for most of the proteins, you do see it 50-50. So for the M protein, it's 50% non-synonymous, 50% synonymous, same for ORF7B. But there are some proteins where you see a much higher prevalence of non-synonymous mutations. So mutations that change the protein compared to synonymous mutations. So spike, for instance, and envelope, you can see that these are proteins that actually have a significantly higher number of non-synonymous mutations versus synonymous. It breaks the 50-50 rule that you would expect. And I find this interesting because the envelope protein and the spike protein are found on the surface of the virus. If you know any immunology, you may know that the surface of the virus is more subject to B cell and antibody responses. So it has a really strong evolutionary pressure on it. Whereas the inside viral proteins are more subject to T cell responses. And so what this is telling me is that the proteins that have significantly more non-synonymous mutations versus synonymous, it may be because they have such a high evolutionary pressure on them because of B cell and antibody responses that they are favoring or positively selecting for mutations that change the way that they physically look so that they can evade the immune response. And so it's interesting that the proteins that you think have the highest evolutionary pressure on them are positively selecting for mutations that change the way they look as a means of viral evolution. So um, real quickly, in terms of conclusions, we were able to find that wastewater surveillance of SARS-CoV-2 works for pandemic tracking. It was predictive and also a positive correlation between clinical cases and wastewater testing. We we're identifying similar variants of concern, but we also were able to identify new mutations that have not been um, characterized yet that could be potentially um, parts of future variants. And we also found that non-synonymous mutations are positively selected for. In the future, we're wanting to expand this to look for other viruses such as polio virus within our community. We also wanna optimize the protocol to prevent loss. It's really easy to lose RNA in this process and then disseminate these results, which we've already done with the local community through online trackers, but also to become a part of the National Wastewater Surveillance um, Program with the CDC. So with that, I have to give some acknowledgement. So all of this work was done in um, conjunction with students. So in bold here, I'm showing students that donated their time either through volunteering, SURE grants, independent study. Um, so for the Merkel cell polyomavirus Merkel cell carcinoma project, it was Kyra Tevinen, Goldie Robinson, Amanda Molina, and Hannah Collins that worked independently on this project outside of classes. In the SARS-CoV-2 project, Brian Sanchez, Trinity Sterling, and Austin Brown donated their time over the summer to work on this project. I've also had support from both the health sciences and biology departments, 
Um, none of this is made possible without funding to buy all the reagents. So from Stetson, startup funds, Lowry grants, summer grants, sure grants for my students, and then health sciences research funds made this possible. Um, we also received external funding from the Cell Biology Education Consortium. And then recently, Kyra, um, Trinity, and Brian presented all the research that I just showed you at a conference in Anaheim, California. So the annual biomedical research conference of minoritized students where Kyra actually won an award. The only reason we were able to go to this conference is through funding, um, through Abercam's judging awards for me, travel awards for my students. The Dean's Fund also helped um, with the expenses. And then we received a donation from a previous Stetson graduate, Major Ashley Rutherford, which also helped make it possible for us to attend this conference. So thank you. I will be happy now to take any questions from really anything, but maybe more specifically the SARS-CoV-2 project. Hey, Christine, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, great job. That's really interesting with the SARS-CoV-2 project. Um, those mutations that you found, um, the non-synonymous ones, are they similar to any published ones or are they new mutations that you guys specifically found? Most of them were similar and they've been found in other variants of concern. There were a few though. So I showed just for the spike protein. Mm -hmm. I just go back a few slides. So the ones with the red boxes, were the ones that have not been shown in any other variants of concern before. So you can see all the ones with the blue boxes have been described before, but these ones have not. And I'm just showing the spike protein, but we've done this for um, all the proteins in SARS-CoV-2. And, and so these they, will be the ones to look for. Yeah, so that's interesting. So are they in like um, specific domains that are known to- Yeah, that's something I need to do in the future when I have more time <laughs> to analyze yes. all this data. Um, but if they're found, for instance, in the receptor binding domain, that would be really interesting because that could affect binding to ACE2 and entry of the virus into the cell. But really anything on the spike protein, um, a mutation could evade antibody responses. So if we see the frequency increasing over time, that means it's an advantageous mutation. And so maybe it's, it has a degree of immune evasion. So previous exposure um, mediated antibodies cannot interact with it anymore. And that's why it's advantageous. So that's something we can determine. Um, we're gonna we do this whole genome sequencing about every month, and then mm -hmm. we're gonna compare the frequency. So, for instance, this mutation was at twelve percent. If it is up to you know anything higher than twelve percent next time, that means that it's out competing the other variants that don't have that mutation, which means it most likely has some degree of immune evasion that the others didn't. Yeah, that's really interesting. Thanks, Christine. Yeah. Okay, thank you.